أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم From the rejected shaitan In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful In all things, I am faithful to what Muhammad and his purified family, peace be upon them, have spoken In that which they have kept secret and that which they have made known And that which has reached me of them and that which is not Praised be Allah, the Lord of the worlds. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon the Master of all creation, our Master, Muhammad and his purified progeny. May Allah's damnations and curses be upon their enemies and murderers until the hereafter. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon the Fatima al-Zahra, the martyr. And may Allah damn her killers and her enemies and all those who have harmed her and all those who have abandoned her. She was it was one of the uh, attempts of the first Dajjal, the tyrant Abu Bakr, may Allah revile him, to usurp the rights of the Lady Az-Zahra, peace be upon her. There were a few things, uh, justifications he used, uh, some of which have uh, been mentioned uh, last night in his response to her when she has refuted his claims, saying that what you ask for, we have used for the Muslims to buy weapons and horses with, to struggle against the disbelievers and fight and do jihad against the disbelievers. Uh, Abu Bakr claims that the land of Fadak and the prophets made through the land of Fadak Simply he decided to spend this, uh, this prophet to do jihad against the disbelievers. By that he means that the wealth of Fadak is spent in a, a religious uh, matter, a religious reason. So why, Fatima, are you trying to uh, regain this wealth? Leave it to us. The first issue with this uh, claim is that is this side truly uh, abiding by Sharia law or not? You have learned, brothers, that the wars that were fought by the regime of Abu Bakr, all of them were not wars uh, against the uh, disbelievers and the apostates. In fact, uh, a large portion of it was wars uh, versus the Muslims, Muslims who testified with the two shahadat. And their only guilt being the guilt that uh, was enough to be uh, be labeled as a disbeliever and an apostate is that they refused to pay allegiance to Abu Bakr and to pay him the uh, alms uh, money. And the regime of Abu Bakr, in response, declared them or denounced them as apostates. And they fought them and they committed massacres uh, to those people as was uh, admitted 
by the scholars of the opposers, and one of them is Shafi. They have uh, clearly uh, admitted and accepted that. Then these wars were not uh, wars that abide by Sharia law, not at all. They, they were er erroneous and uh, must be criticized. The regime of Abu Bakr, the government of Abu Bakr, was the first uh, uh, takfiri uh, uh, government, Sim similar to ISIS. The ISIS regime uh, also was a such takfiri regime declaring denounces, uh, denouncing others simply because they refused to pay allegiance to their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Simply, we, can, we cannot say that all those who fought Abu Bakr were apostates. Among them, there were innocent Muslims. They rejected the regime of Abu Bakr for ascending to success, uh, succession that does not belong to him. As was uh, reported in the history books, and we have uh, mentioned them, uh, examples of that in the past, uh, they said, if someone from the family of the Messenger of Allah was a successor, uh, then we would have paid our allegiance to him, and we would have paid the zakah, the alms money. But we do not pay this zakah to Abu Bakr. So for what reason were they declared apostates and uh, killed after? Then, what Abu Bakr uh, wanted to uh, use in his defense or a claim saying that he's using this money or this wealth that is being requested by the Zara, peace be upon her, and in, in for religious reasons, for the sake of the is, uh, Islam, is false. And it is refuted by reality itself because we saw his government, a regime, spending the wealth in places that are not abiding by Sharia law. And second, does he, does he truly not uh, spend this wealth uh, only, uh, he spends this wealth only to fight the apostates and not Muslims, even if that was true, it still does not legitimize his acts because the, the wealth he has confiscated does not belong to him. He usurped the rights of others. And the uh, Sharia law ruling says you cannot obey Allah from where you disobey him. Is it uh, permissible for a government to come to a Muslim person, confiscate his wealth, and then use that wealth to build a mosque with it? No, it cannot. Can the, uh, this regime also reject his claim to his wealth, saying the money now you request is money we spent to build a mosque? So what do, do, why do you ask it? We uh, did something good with it. No, that is not acceptable. This is not uh, in compliance with Sharia law. In fact, this mosque must uh, may be demolished because it was not... Uh, built with uh, permissible means. Even the prayer in it will not be accepted. Why? Because this prayer in, in a confiscated land uh, unjustly. So for what reason does Abu Bakr think he can take the rights away from Zara, peace be upon her, her, her wealth, her inheritance, and claim that he's uh, using it to fight and uh, do jihad against the disbelievers and the uh, apostates. That is false entirely. Did Abu Bakr do this with others as well, or only Zara, peace be upon her? And by the way, there is uh, many of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, of the Muhajireen and Ansar, that the Messenger of Allah has uh, given them uh, wealth uh, and properties and gifts. Did Abu, Bakr, uh, did Abu Bakr confiscate those two simply because he wants to spend this wealth for what he has confiscate, uh, confiscated 
to uh, prepare armies, weapons, and uh, horses uh, to prepare for these wars? No, he has not. He only did this act with uh, Zahra, peace be upon her. This is how we know that what Abu Bakr has claimed is uh, uh, simply a, a political twist uh, to defend himself. His claim is false. And in, in reality, and before everything else, Abu Bakr, he has no right to act on the behalf of any Muslim in regards to their wealth. He is not even a legitimate Khalifa. So according to what he thinks it is right to do what he wills with this uh, wealth or uh, money. He has no right uh, to it at all. Then what is the true reason? Why did Abu Bakr uh, insist to revoke the rights of the Zahra, peace be upon her, and to usurp the land of Fadak for his own gain? What is the reason behind it? We have um, spoke of this and described the reason in the past that uh, the land of Fadak was a source of great wealth. And Abu Bakr and his likes, they had their eyes set on this wealth because they wanted to use this wealth to afford their wars against the, uh, or their um, conflicts against the Muslims to legitimize Abu Bakr. They wanted this wealth as a means to uh, afford this uh, uh, target. And uh, Umar ibn Suhaq has admitted to that and proved it. And this is the text of what has been admitted by the opposers in the Seerat al halabiya uh, volume 3, page uh, 512. He said in the words of Sabt ibn Jawzi that him, he means uh, Abu Bakr, may Allah revile him, uh, wrote to her uh, of Fadak. When Zara, peace be upon her, came to Abu Bakr, said, I want Fadak, he wrote to her, yes, it's your right. But when, what did happen after this uh, agreement? Omar, the opposers say, Omar, may Allah revile him, came to Abu Bakr and he said, what are you doing? He said, this is a letter I will send to Fatima, peace be upon her, of what she has inherited of her father. Then Umar said to him, then how will you spend, and how will you spend uh, or afford your, uh, your, yourself when the Arabs have stood against you? Pay attention to this, that Umar has made Abu Bakr aware of this, that if you give her Fadak, then how will you afford or spend? And the Arabs have fought you, waged war against you, or opposed you. He did not say that the Arabs did apostates. He did not say the, uh, the Arabs became disbelievers. He said they fought you. There is a rebellion or an uprising. Those Muslims who refused to pay you zakam, how will you use force to uh, bring them under your banner and to force them? So he encouraged them, and that caused Abu Bakr to change his mind, saying, how will you spend for these Muslims? And these Arabs have stood against you. Then when Abu Bakr heard this, he took his letter and ripped it. Then the true reason why Fadak was confiscated is to 
provide the foundation for the government of Abu Bakr. This uh, uh, twist, or political twist he, he tried in the beginning could not be justified. Claiming that this wealth will be spent for the sake of jihad, no, that is not acceptable in, in accordance with the Sharia law. His second uh, attempt, he said to her, as we have mentioned uh, last night, how do you expect me to oppose the directive of your father? May Allah uh, blessings and peace be upon him. Claiming that I heard the Messenger of Allah say, we prophets do not leave inheritance behind. Uh, how can you accept that I oppose the directive of, of your father? It's as if he is uh, alluding to the listeners that he is simply trying to stick to the traditions and the directive of the messengers as they were. He does not want alternatives or to change or innovate. Was Abu Bakr truly like this, we ask? Did he walk the same steps of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him? Did he follow his method? Not at all. The truth, the reality is that he opposed the Messenger of Allah. He contradicted him. And this is proof that no opposer can do anything but accept it. In Sunani Abi Dawood, we find this in section describing the matters of dividing uh, the one-fifth levy, khums, narration 2978, and it is an authentic narration it was uh, authentic, uh, authenticated by the Albani. In this narration of Jubair ibn Mut'am, one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, he spoke, Abu Bakr divided uh, khums uh, the way the Messenger of Allah did. Until here, very well, he did what the Messenger of Allah did when it came to dividing khums. But he gave the relatives of the Messenger of Allah what the Messenger of Allah has given them. And this is proof that he did contradict the Messenger of Allah. And on purpose too. To harm uh, antagonize the purified progeny, not giving them what is uh, what is due to them of the khums. And the narration is uh, authentic. Then Abu Bakr was not following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. According to this narration, that's authentic to those uh, opposers, that no one of the Muslims has the right to claim Abu Bakr was a so-called uh, or Sunni. Because what it means to be a Sunni, it means a man that follows the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah to the letter. And in here, in the what is due to the uh, Qurba, the family of the Messenger of Allah, he contradicted the Messenger of Allah. That means he's not a Sunni. He is an innovator. A tyrant and one who contradicts and opposes the sunnah of the messenger of Allah so this second attempt, attempt of his does not work his honeyed words also do not affect us who, we, who are free when he speaks to the Zara peace be upon her uh, in an emotional way saying how can you expect me to oppose the directive of the messenger of Allah as if he claims he does not ever oppose the directive of the Messenger of Allah. And here there's proof that you have. Allah 
despises that you claim what you do not do. His second, uh, his third attempt. And in an answer he gave to the uh, lady, peace be upon her. And we could have not. And here he is uh, claiming, falsifying, in here, falsifying a narration, saying that the Messenger of Allah spoke those words, that we, the prophets, do not leave inheritance behind. And what has left, uh, what is left uh, behind after us, then it is to those who succeed us in their re uh, rulership. We use this against him, and we say to him, Ibn Abi Quhafa, let us assume that the Messenger of Allah did say those words you have claimed. And let us also assume that you are the legitimate successor, hypothetically uh, speaking. Then why did you not rule or judge for the matter of Fadik with a judgment that you we become generous to the Lady of Zara, peace be upon her, and respect and honor her, and respect and honor her father? Uh, uh, for the sake of her father. As, uh, as long as you narrate of the Messenger of Allah that what was left over or from the Messenger of Allah, the successor that comes after him can decide what to do with it. He can uh, have his own judgment and then choose that this wealth that he sees he can please with this uh, act or his decision. The leader of this uh, Sharia, the daughter of the man of this Sharia, I came to you and she said to you, Fedek is mine. It is what was inherited. But you refused and you rejected. You rejected it by this narration that you have falsified. But in the reminder of this narration that you have claimed, you said what is left by the, uh, us, the prophets, is to the rightful successors after us. Then as long as the wealth is yours, then you can do with it what can please Lady Zahra, peace be upon her. Give her back a fedek, even if as a gift, as a respect, as uh, an honoring her and the purified progeny. Why did you not do that? A poser might come to us and say, No, by Allah, Abu Bakr was not the one that could have given what belongs to Allah and the Muslims to some individual. And even if that individual was a relative and, and daughter of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him. I respond to this ignorant opposer, uh, opposer if he ever spoke those words, to hold on uh, and wait, because Abu Bakr has done that. He has done it with others, not to the Zahra, peace be upon him. He allowed them to uh, have what belongs to Allah. One of those is Mu'adh ibn Jabl. He took what was uh, belonging to Allah until he became wealthy. And Umar opposed that. And But Abu Bakr refused and denied uh, the complaints of Umar and insisted that he gives this wealth to Ma'ad so he becomes wealthy. When it was complained to Abu Bakr what has been done, he said, I am the successor, I am the authority, and I decide what to do with this wealth. Even if Ma'ad 
did what he wants with it and traded with it and became wealthy, I will not take it from him to honor him as a sign of respect. This narration is also uh, accepted by the opposers and narrated by Abdul Razak al Sanani. 15,177 uh, of Ka'b ibn Malik, the companion of uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and a poet who said, Mu'adh ibn Jabal was an attractive and generous man And he could not withhold his hand, as in he spent a lot of money. Until one day he became in debt. And that was the, during the uh, life of the Messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him. He became in debt. And what he owned of uh, lands and properties became requested to pay for his debt. So he came to the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, ask him to uh, request of those who uh, uh, he is in debt with to um, let go of their rights and, and not request what is due to them. And despite the Messenger of Allah mediating for him, those people refused even the mediation of the Messenger of Allah. That is why the uh, narration said, if they would have ever done this act, they would have done it for the sake of the Messenger of Allah, but they did not even respect the Messenger of Allah. That also leads you to believe that uh, those individuals that are supposed to be the companions, Ansar, and those who will, are willing to sacrifice themselves for the Messenger of Allah, what truly, what was the uh, importance of the Messenger of Allah uh, in their hearts when he mediates and they refuse? Yes, some of them did respect the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, and they would excuse others uh, if they, are, uh, they owe them anything, and would free one of their slaves even for, to, for the sake of honoring the Messenger of Allah such as that uh, uh, slave woman that uh, was late to her owner, uh, her family and, and she was afraid and then the Messenger of Allah took her to her uh, home of those who owned her and when the owners of the homes uh, saw her with the Messenger of Allah When they saw that sight uh, and how the Messenger of Allah walked with her to their home, they said, she's free for the sake of you walking to her home. But at, the, at, the, at best, you see that majority of them, they only were accompanying this Messenger and following this Messenger for the sake of dunya, for the sake of this worldly life, because it was a means to uh, attain dunya or worldly goals. Uh, faith never uh, faith never uh, was uh, truly in their hearts. And Allah says, no matter how much you try, most people will not be believers. Uh, at any rate, when those who Mu'adh uh, uh, owed money to uh, refused the mediation of the Messenger of Allah to excuse him. The Messenger of Allah, they, it is said, sold what he had uh, of the uh, belongings of Mu'adh, uh, saying that uh, the Messenger of Allah said to Mu'adh, now you must sell everything you have to pay back what is you uh, you uh, owe to people until Mu'adh had nothing left at all. Then what happened after? 
Jubair ibn Mut'im, Ka'b ibn Malik, apologies, said, uh, when it was the day of the Fath uh, Mecca, uh, he sent Ma'ath to a group of uh, people in uh, Yemen as a prince uh, to uh, uh, please his heart. And then Ma'ath stayed for uh, the, in there for a while. And he, he was one of the first, oh, the first, he was the first to abuse the wealth of, uh, and the treasury of, and the wealth of Allah, uh, the zakah money and alms and so on and so forth. Uh, he used it as his own capital and did what he willed with it for his own gain. Until he became very wealthy. And he remained uh, and continued doing that until he became very wealthy. Until even the, uh, the passing of the Messenger of Allah. He continued... He continued uh, using the money uh, or the wealth of Allah for his own sake until the passing of the Messenger of Allah, until Abu Bakr uh, claimed succession. And then it said, when the Messenger of Allah passed away, Umar said to Abu Bakr, send to this man, he means Mu'adh, and leave for him what is enough for him, suffices him to live, and take the rest away from him. Abu Bakr responded, the messenger of Allah sent him to please his heart, and I will not take anything of him uh, if he does not wish, it to give, uh, wish to give it to me. Then Umar went uh, back to, uh, went to Mu'adh when Abu Bakr refused uh, the request of uh, Umar. And he told him of what Abu Bakr uh, said to him, saying that this is the wealth of Allah, and uh, you can uh, live off what suffices you, and the rest must come back to the treasury of the Muslims. Ma'ad said to him, the Messenger of Allah sent me uh, for a reason, and I will not do what you ask. Days passed, and it is said in the narration, Ma'ad met Amr. Now I will obey. Now I accept. Perhaps a few days later, I do not want all this wealth. You can take it back. And I will do what you have uh, directed me to. But what's ch what has changed your mind, Ma'ath? He said, I saw in my dream in, in, the, in water and saw myself uh, fear of drowning. He saw that he said that he saw in my in my dream that I was drowning, and then you saved me, Omar. He's he say, saying what he he said. I know what I've done and this crime, and I see myself drowning, uh, ending here, and going to Jahannam. But you have saved me. Then I described interpreted this dream that I am doing a sin now for what I have done with this wealth. It does not belong to me. And now I must return this uh, wealth where it belongs, to the treasury of the Muslims. Ma'ad then came to Abu Bakr, and he spoke to him of that dream. And he, sw he swore by Allah that he will not hide anything until Abu Bakr uh, decides. Abu Bakr uh, said, responding, Not, notice that Abu Bakr, no one full well, this is the, the what belongs to Allah. And despite what Mu'adh saw in his dream, what led him to believe that he must return this wealth. And also, despite the, uh, the advice and complaint of Umar to Abu Bakr, all of that, and Abu Bakr still said, No, by Allah, I will not take it from you. 
I give it to you as a gift. The wealth of whom? Is it the wealth of your parents? To say to him, I give it to you as a gift? What justification? What ruling Allah did you use that you give him the wealth of zakah and charity and alms? The, uh, the wealth of Allah and the Muslims, what is due to the nation? With what right and according to what law did you gift uh, Ma'ad with this wealth? The reason is clear because he claims he's the authority and I have the right to do this. And according to the claim of Abu Bakr that the Messenger of Allah said what we have as prophets uh, is left after our death then the authorities and successors after us will do with it as they wish. Then I decided then according to that to give Ma'ad uh, the man who the messenger of Allah sent to the Yemen to lead people there I can give him what uh, he has now and allow him to uh, have it he's saying that I will not take it from you and allow you to have that it's strange that Umar when he heard that word from Abu Bakr changed his stance and opinion entirely saying As, as soon as Abu Bakr said to you, this is a gift to you, then now it, it is uh, uh, permissible for you. Congratulations. And then Mu'adh, when, heard, when he heard that, he went to the Levant. Uh, truly, Mu'adh went to Sham, Levant, and with him he had great wealth and lived as a king. If, of what? Wealth. It was the wealth, the bounty of Allah. With what shar, uh, Sharia law uh, was he allowed to take this wealth with him? Because it was the authority of Abu Bakr that has legitimized his wealth. Then why did he not do the same with the Lady Az Zahra, peace be upon her? Is she less than Ma'ath? Is she a lesser person? Why did you not honor Zahra? Why did you not respect her feelings for the sake of her feelings? Saying that, yes, I have Fadiq, but I will gift it to you because I am an authority and I can do that. That is, if you are even an authority. He did no such thing. And uh, of this narration, we have a few comments to make. The first is, Uh, is it possible that the Messenger of Allah, when he sent Mu'adh to uh, uh, Yemen as a prince, a leader there, for pleasing his heart, was it uh, because the Messenger of Allah wanted by this that Mu'adh will confiscate the uh, wealth and the bounty of Allah and the treasury in there and to become wealthy of it, uh, more than he needs, more than suffices him. Is it acceptable that we think the Messenger of Allah wanted that uh, for Mu'adh? Can we uh, interpret the uh, words of Ka'b ibn Malik, uh, this word to uh, please him? Was it he meant to allow him to do as he wills? with the treasury of the Muslims to become uh, a millionaire? No, it was not. In fact, in history, the Messenger of Allah he mentioned that he sent Mu'adh as a judge and a, and a prince. Uh, that is all. As a lawgiver. And as a leader or there, it is... Uh, expected that when the alms charity and zakah and so on and so forth comes to him that he does not do with them what does not please Allah what is the judgment of Allah that charity is to the poor and those who work for the sake of this charity 
those who work, those who gather charity, they have the right to take a small uh, a pr percentage of it. But the uh, jurisprudence in Islam is, uh, what is the percentage of his uh, uh, rights? Could he take 90% of the, uh, the alms and then give 10% to the poor? Of course not. No one says that entirely. No jurisprudent and no juris, uh, qualified jurist would say that. Uh, all the scholars of all the sects, they say that those who work for charity and gather charity, they have uh, uh, the right to this alms, but only what suffices them. It could be no more than 1%. Uh, as as long as it suffices him so he can live but to take all of it and to use it as it is own personal wealth and becoming uh, wealthy with it then no one says that uh, Ibn Baz the uh, Imam of the Wahhabi uh, sect has a book known as Majmu' al-Fatawa in this book Volume four, uh, 14, page 14, he says those who gather charity uh, or alms are those who the authority appoints to go and travel uh, and gather the alms money and uh, bring it to the treasury. Uh, they are the safeguards of uh, this wealth and they are given of it, what suffices uh, and what uh, pays for their time and effort spent according to what the authority seems or deems suitable. Not that they can take or do what they will with it. So we cannot defend the position of Rebek uh, in what he has allowed Mu'adh to do and to allow him to take all this wealth, claiming that the only reason uh, the messenger of Allah sent him to Yemen is so that he could have wealth again after losing everything. And even if the messenger of Allah said those words, if this narration is true, there's no way he could have meant that Mu'adh can do what he wants with the treasury of the Muslims there. We cannot even imagine that that, that was the, the meaning uh, by the uh, decision of the messenger of Allah if we have then that causes us to see that uh, the messenger of Allah uh, Allah forbid has committed an injustice and he's far from that and uh, also on top of that we saw in the narrations of the uh, opposers what leads us to believe and see that when the messenger of Allah sent Mu'ath to Yemen he warned him not to do that he, want, he warned him not to uh, do with the treasury what is not his right. And if he has, then he would become a betrayer. Where did this uh, uh, text come? We find it in Seer Al-Alam Al-Nubala by Dhabi, volume 1, page uh, 447 of Qais ibn Hazim of Mu'adh who said the messenger of Allah sent me to uh, the Yemen and uh, on my way there he sent someone after me so I returned to him saying I was on my way uh, outside Medina to go to Yemen and then a messenger came after me saying that the Messenger of Allah wishes to speak with you. Then the Messenger of Allah said to him, Do you know why I sent after you? Do not do without knowledge uh, in regards to, this, uh, to the treasury because it is an injustice and if you come to the hereafter with an injustice and uh, I have threatened you now with this or 
uh, warned you against that. And the Messenger of Allah is warm, uh, warning him and mostly, in fact, was actually indicating that he knows what he will be doing it. Then why would he send him back on, on his way? He knows full well that this person, Mu'adh, is not trustworthy and cannot betray, uh, and can betray. He's warning him of what he knows will happen. Do not do with the wealth it what is not your right. And now I have terrified you with this fact. Now you know what will happen. Now you can go. Ka'bna ibn Malik said and uh, describing what he saw of Mu'adh in Yemen. Mu'adh was the first person to do what was not his right uh, with the wealth of the uh, treasury. And the uh, Messenger of Allah told him not to and he has became wealthy with the wealth he uh, stole. So we cannot expect that the Messenger of Allah sent him to Yemen so he becomes incredibly wealthy. Maybe so that he does not feel poverty. Maybe that he can take uh, a portion of that uh, alms money for uh, his own sake to s so that what uh, suffices him and no more but to take all of it for his own that is not uh, acceptable and also it is clear that what Mu'adh uh, was uh, what Mu'adh done was a betrayal and according to the dream he saw when he said I saw myself drowning until Umar grabbed me and saved me then that means he knows he is surrounded in, in this sin and in what he's been doing why did Abu Bakr not uh, use um, uh, what he has uh, seen of evidence and dreams and uh, advice and directive he neglected all of these things the man himself actually came to, to Abu Bakr after what he saw in his dream and said I will return all this wealth if Abu Bakr was truly careful about the uh, wealth of Allah the bounty of Allah and careful and cautious about the uh, treasury of the Muslims and their welfare, then he would have said, yes, return the money and I will uh, put it back where it belongs. But then he swore by Allah saying that I will not take it from you. It is a gift from me to you. But why do you want to know the reason? Because Mu'adh, has uh, a favor uh, for Abu Bakr has done a favor for him and uh, something that pleased Abu Bakr a stance which he took in defense of Abu Bakr that Abu Bakr cannot forget and once you hear that when you hear this you know why this stance this position aided the legitimacy or the throne of Abu Bakr uh, day after when the uh, sacred Med Medina was shaken but what, what some of the uh, Rafali companions heroic Rafali companions of the Messenger of Allah peace and, and blessings be upon him in his a sacred mosque those the story of those 12 of the muhajirin and ansar that stopped the speech of Abu Bakr on the day of Friday and then uh, 
requested that he gives back uh, the succession that he's claimed to the rightful successor, to the rightful authority. They confronted him with uh, very uh, beautiful words that showcase their bravery and and uh, their honor, saying to him, come down from the pulpit. Do you not remember the day of the Ghadir? Do you not remember when the Messenger of Allah said, whoever am um, his authority, then Ali is the authority. Why put yourself forward and it does not belong to you? Twelve men stood against Abu Bakr, one after the other, and there have been some conflicts, and it would have led to people uh, come, uh, going out of hand if Abu Bakr did not descend from the pulpit. And he concealed himself in his home for a week. The situation in the sacred Medina was shaky because of this heroic act by those 12 uh, companions. After that was that uh, very important uh, step, the step of using terror and threats and violence. Omar, may Allah revile him, gathered with him a people and he gave them weapons and then they went and took Abu Bakr. On the next Friday, they took him from his home in a demonstration and by force they put Abu Bakr on the, on the pulpit, allowed him to go on the pulpit using the threat of sword, uh, swords and violence. And Umar threatened saying that if anyone spoke what those 12 have spoken on the last Friday, we would uh, end his life and cut off his neck. The narration is in Rajal al-Barqi. In the last pages of uh, the book, page 66, the narration of the 12 people who uh, denied that Abi Bakr takes the place of the Messenger of Allah. And the uh, narration says Abu Bakr descended from the pulpit. And the next week, the next Friday, Umar uh, uh, unsheathed his sword, saying that I will not hear a single word like that was said in the previous week. And if I do hear anything similar, I will cut the heads of those who do. Then he went, Salim and Mu'adh ibn Jamil and Abu Ubaidah with their swords unsheathed and they took Abu Bakr and by uh, force they allowed him to sit on the pulpit. Abu Bakr thanked Mu'adh his stance, his position and his act that he was the one that raised his sword in defense of Abu Bakr and allowed him to sit on the pulpit of the Messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him again. He thanked this act of terrorism by Ma'ath. He could, not, he could not take this wealth away from him. It's not important. He can have it. And Ma'ath has another act, uh, another uh, stance. This describe and explain why Abu, Abu Bakr so easily allowed him to uh, do what he wanted with the treasury. The second scenario event is because he abandoned the Lady Azara, peace and blessings be upon her, when she mentioned him by name. A narration was uh, mentioned or uh, reported by a book of Khasas and long narration by uh, our master, al Sadiq, peace be upon him. In this narration, uh, Fatima, peace be upon her, uh, reached out to Mu'adh and she said to him, uh, Oh Mu'adh, 
I come to you seeking support. And you have paid allegiance to the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, that you would support him and his purified progeny, his uh, descendants, and to defend them with what you would defend yourself and your own uh, descendants. And by the way, this was the, the condition of the Messenger of Allah, that you pay me allegiance to aid me and my uh, Ahlul Bayt, my descendants. All the Muslims paid allegiance to uh, the Messenger of Allah with uh, uh, this condition. But how many of them remain to loyal to this? That was the first test when the Lady Zara came uh, to them and she said, do uphold your promise. Very few of them did. Mu'adh ibn Jabal was not one of them. Zara, peace be upon her, came to him and by name she said, you have paid allegiance to the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him. To aid and support him and his and defend them uh, of what you would have done for your own. And Abu Bakr has took my rights uh, for Fadak. Then defend me here and aid me if you truly uh, up to the promise you made. If you truly a man, then do. What did this debased person respond to the, uh, how did he respond? He said to her, is someone else with me? She said, no, no one has responded to me. Then he said, how could I possibly aid you? Claiming that on my own I cannot do anything. Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, uh, said, he is the narrator of this, uh, she said she left him. His son, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, came back, uh, came after the Lady Zahra left. He said, why was the daughter of the uh, Muhammad was here? He said, she's seeking my support uh, against uh, Abu Bakr uh, for taking Fadak from her. He said, what did you respond? He said, I told her, what, how can I uh, do that on my own? And his son was surprised saying, you would refuse to. Uh, and he said, yes. Then he said, what did she say to you? She said, by Allah, And she said, uh, I will She was uh, threatened him, said by Allah, Yom, the, the day of the hereafter, the resurrection, we will meet. There is no more words between me and you. Uh, you are a betrayer. Of course he would abandon his Zara, peace be upon him. Who else would abandon his Zara? except those who eat what is haram, what is not, uh, what is prohibited. Ma'ad did eat, uh, eat uh, from uh, the prohibited wealth of others and use it for his own. Of course he will abandon his zara. Those who are not like this and those who are legitimate, uh, would they ever abandon zara, peace be upon her? Only an illegitimate person or a child and uh, those who consume what is prohibited uh, are the ones who could possibly abandon a Zara, peace be upon her. And the Lady Zara said, by Allah, I will meet you in the uh, day of resurrection and we will uh, find justice there. That was he responded to his son when his son said, what did you do? But this showed that his son had a sense of honor. He said, by Allah, I will do just like the lady Azara, peace be upon her, when uh, I meet you in the day of resurrection. Because you did not respond to the daughter of Muhammad. Me too, I will stand against you in the day of resurrection. And I'm your son. I'm of you. But how shameful. My father abandons the daughter of Muhammad, peace be upon her. 
and stands with Abu Abi Bakr. I do not know you even if you are my father. This is the believer. The believer is that does not have any concern for the sake of Zahra to anyone who is a relative, son, daughter, father, and cousin. He knows only Allah. If the father is with the messenger of Allah and his purified progeny, then we respect him. But when he becomes an enemy or an ab one who betrays and abandons, then I do not know him. A son that is like this, by if Allah forbid, like this, a brother that is like this, Allah forbid, then I do not know him anymore. This is a principle. Not to put forward uh, ahead of Allah uh, a relation or friendship Not at all. Never. Those who we have no connection uh, to, far from us, if they were sincere to Allah, to the Messenger of Allah, to His purified progeny, peace be upon them, then He is closest to us. Of those who are our blood uh, relatives, if they were betrayers, We bring the son of Mu'adh ibn, uh, ibn Jabal and we say to him, you're one of us and you're, and we're one, uh, and we're uh, of you. And we bring Ibn Abbas, who is the uh, cousin of the messenger of Allah. And we say to him, we do not know you because you abandoned and betrayed. You're from the Hashimi tribe and you are also a relative to the messenger of Allah. But you have betrayed the Messenger of Allah. And you have betrayed the daughter of the Messenger of Allah. Ali came uh, to the Masjid of uh, Nabi, peace be upon him, after the uh, coup of Abu Bakr and Umar. And he saw them there, uh, the Saqifa, and Ibn Abbas was there. And he said to them, and he said to Ibn Abbas, Did you hear the Messenger of Allah uh, given authority to Abu Bakr after him? He said, no, I did not hear that except you. Then he said, why did you then pay allegiance to Abu Bakr? He said, because people gathered uh, and accepted Abu Bakr and I was with them. Then uh, the Imam responded to uh, him, just like the people of uh, those that worship the, the uh, golden cow, or calf, they gathered to worship it and left uh, Moses, peace be upon him. You are just like those. You must be like this uh, as a Rafali person. You put Allah always in front of you and in your eyes. And no matter how close someone is to you, you do not uh, have concern for them. What is important is that you meet Allah and that your past is clean and pure. His son said to him, these are incidents and events that we must learn and teach our sons so they become lessons uh, for the future. So that this a fire, the Sravali fire, does not become extinguished. So we do not become like what happened to the Jordanian uh, kings, that until now they rule, and that their ancestors were of the Sh Shia, and then now they have changed their ways entirely. Ask Allah, you as a father, that someone in your line or family Anyone in your family to have uh, uh, any inclinations that are Bakri or Bachri, be inc incredibly careful and raise your uh, sons and daughters as well. Feed them with this, uh, these realities and facts. T teach them these uh, uh, events and incidents. 
So they remember forever. So they do not ever forget. So they become always on this path. Uh, peace to the peace, those who make peace to Ahlul Bayt. And enemy to those who are enemies of Ahlul Bayt. Is that to remain a free rejecter, a rafili. Then what will you say to Allah when the... Uh, If you were not careful raising your children uh, on the Rafali way, then how will you answer of Allah if one of your uh, sons become apostates? There are people who are uh, descendants of the Prophet Hashimin that have become apostates, disbelievers in Allah, atheists. Uh, one of them is a person in Lebanon who is known, uh, he was a Sayyid, uh, Alawi, and a Fatimi, he became a, a so-called Christian, is known as Joseph, and he even has uh, poems in praising uh, Ahlul Bayt, but his faith is a so-called uh, Christian. How did this become? Possibly one of his uh, ancestors did not raise or teach his sons the ideas and the ideologies and then the principles of Tashayu uh, and allowed them to lose themselves to the needs of this dunya, studies and such and uh, and uh, but with it there was no strong beliefs and no st sense of faith. Uh, you are proud because your son became a minister and a great qualification, but your son does not even pray. Happy that your son has reached ranks, but he does not even uh, pray. He does not even know the names of his imams, peace be upon them. This is a reality that exists. How much you spend time, especially in these Western nations, how much time do you spend? Hours teaching him this. How many hours do you teach him about his faith? When, even when you bring him to the mosque, he comes and stays outside and plays games or sits in a corner and plays his games on his phone. Does not hear anything. Does not learn anything. Maybe sometimes I remember uh, that sometimes my father would take us to the mosque and we would do a lot mayat for Mom Hussein. That will even melt away if he lets his, himself go for the sake of the desires of dunya and be deceived by it. Do become, uh, do your best. Do struggle to teach and do struggle to show your son why you need to teach him about Rafali uh, method. Why are we Muslims? Why are we Shia? That is, that is what is expected and that is what is needed. Peace and blessings be upon him, said Fatima, uh, left Mu'adh ibn Jabal, saying, By Allah, I will not speak to you until I meet you uh, in the hereafter uh, and, and the sights of the Messenger of Allah. Then she went. The Zahra, peace be upon her, is condemning and uh, cursing not only those who are our enemies but also those who abandoned him, abandoned her beware not to be one of those uh, as you as a Shia to abandon Zahra peace be upon her and do you know what it is like to become one of those who abandon Zahra peace be upon her it is when you hear a scream saying Ya Latharat Zahra or vengeance for Zahra May Allah curse those who killed her. May Allah curse or revile Abu Bakr and Umar. And you would come. And I do not say that you fight that. Because if you have done, that is a great betrayal to um, uh, the uh, Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. A group of the believers uh, dissociate publicly in demonstrations by name of Abu Bakr and Umar. That pleases Zahra. She considered, uh, considers that as aid and support. And she will, uh, it will, uh, she considers it as support. But then 
a man that claims he he's a Shi'i and uh, a person who's with responsibility and comes and uh, uses violence against those people and even puts them in jail. This deserves to be reviled. This is a great crime and betrayal. I do not speak of those. I speak of those who just simply walk and, and watch. Those who watch and do not do anything. And they abandon also cause others to abandon. Saying th th such things as, what's it to us to get involved? Those people are causing sectarianism and disunity. Those are people who abandon the uh, Lady of Zahra, peace be upon her, unwittingly, without knowing. That is why they do not see uh, well in our nations. Why there is so much trouble in our nations? Because we abandon the Zahra, peace be upon her. Our relation to the Ahl al-Bayt is not a, a healthy one. It is the relation of a traders. Unfortunately, many of the Shias are those who have the relation of a trader. By that we mean he wants something of Ahl al-Bayt, he has a need. And for that need, he becomes a Shi'i and he will get involved in the rituals and rites. For, for the sake of that need, he goes and walks to the shrine of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. So he attains his, his uh, need and his desire. It is trading. But even that re religious circle, those who are called uh, um, you know, the Mu'ammameen, and uh, the uh, lecturers, poets, so on and so forth, they are trading. Basically, what he gains in terms of uh, money and uh, material gain, then he will serve Ahl al-Bayt. If they tell them serving is free, then he would not do it. They might do it for sake of others, and uh, as uh, uh, bringing him closer to others, he might do it, but they would not re usually. They're not willing to lose their wealth, their properties, his self, his, his own soul, to sacrifice all of that for the sake of al -Bayt. If he did, then he should have followed what the uh, Rafa of the first world would do, to let go of this life and everything in it. The Imam, peace be upon him, says, uh, The Imam says, peace be upon him, uh, praising uh, the, the mu'minun and the faithful who are willing to destroy their life, destroy it entirely for the sake of the uh, hereafter. Those, uh, those who abandoned Zara, peace be upon her, uh, she curses them and we ask Allah that she does not do that because perhaps if Allah wills they probably do not know and they are ignorant but if they see evidence and fact now and they res resist then they will be cursed beware uh, you as a Shia as a Rafali who uh, are um, uh, love the Lady of Zahra and Ahlul Bayt peace be upon them beware not to abandon her a flag was raised in defense of Zahra, peace be upon her. Immediately, you respond saying, I will support you, Fatima. Do not surrender. Do not abandon. And if you do, Allah forbids, you become like Mu'adh ibn Jabal. How did Mu'adh justify? Because he was a person of this dunya, a debased person saying that how could I possibly do anything saying that yes if there was a lot more I could have supported you and that is the reality in fact even now when people see majority and when people gather for something then they will join them but on their own when everyone else is against them would they uh, put themselves forward like this? No, they would not because they're afraid. Those 12 that 
did support Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, after the rebellion of Saqifa, prevented Abu Bakr from speech, or alone. But they reached what levels? One of them was Salman, who Ahl al-Bayt said of him that he's of us. One was Maqdad, for example, who is not known. Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, said of Maqdad, if you want the person who never doubted, never changed, never innovated, then it is Maqdad. His hand on his sword, his eyes pointed to the eyes of the uh, Prince Commander of Believers, waiting for his directive, a soldier waiting for the call. That was Maqdad. Khalid ibn Sa'id ibn al-As, which was an Umawi person. He was called of us Ahl al-Bayt. It is one of the greatest honors, one of the greatest levels he's reached. Those were the twelve. Their names shine in history. They have many such acts in history. Yes, they were few. Uh, an op opposition to hundreds of thousands of people who disobeyed and abandoned the Messenger of Allah. But who won now? Who won in the hereafter? Those 12 did. Even in this life, not just in the hereafter, these names shine even more day after day. But on the other hand, we gather in this night, those who, who are hundreds, thousands, that abandoned, what value do they have in our eyes? Nothing. Zero. Less than zero. We curse them. We revile them. We insult them. They turned out to pe people who have no honor, no fervor, no, uh, no chivalry, nothing. Someone like Mu'adh, who has no value. Who even mentions Mu'adh nowadays? Only some of the remainders of the Bakris and their likes. But on the other hand, how much or how many times is Maqdad and Salman and Abu Dhar and Ammar are mentioned and their likes? How much or what is the extent of their remembrance in this day and age? Do not feel alone. Do not feel alone in championing the way of the, uh, or the justice. Do not be of those who abandon. Zara, peace be upon her, said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, By Allah, I will not speak to you until me, my grandfather, and you meet in the hereafter. And then she went away. Those, the person who is reciting or narrating this is the Imam Sadiq, peace be upon her. And the same narration said that to, uh, of Abi Bakr and Umar and do listen to this uh, Muslims Allah those two were unjust to the daughter of your Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him Allah they were unjust to the daughter uh, of uh, the messenger of Allah and her right so instill your wrath upon them. And in another narration, Saduq, in the book of Shara'ah, uh, it is said, uh, she said, Lady Zara, peace be upon you, I testify in front of you, Allah, testify those who uh, are here, uh, that they have harmed me in my life and in my death. By Allah, I will not speak to you a word until I meet my uh, Lord Allah and complain of what you have done to, to me, to him, uh, for what you have done and what you have committed. Zara, peace be upon her, uh, curses reviles Abu Bakr for what they have done to her. And according to that, we say that if Lady Zahra, peace be upon her, was uh, 
in pained by what Abu Bakr and Umar has done to her for the harm they caused her and that this means in accordance with Islamic laws that Abu Bakr and Umar deserve to be executed execution it is well, in fact the judgment of Abu Bakr and Umar how can we say these words? The opposer would probably now be shaken by what we said and not accept it. We say, no, this is true. Abu Bakr judged in jurisprudence of Islam uh, execution. How? I say to you, by what some of your scholars have decided. There is an event that was mentioned by the Imam of Shafi'iyah, as subki the book of Fatawa as subki is one of the scholars of the Shafi'i sect in the 7th century. In this book, volume 2, page 569, and an event that he was part of and he lived, he said, I was in the Amawi Mosque in Damascus um, Monday, 16th Jamadi Al-Ula and to me uh, was presented a person who pe people were praying the prayer of uh, uh, Dhuhr and he said may Allah revive those who are unjust to the uh, family of the Prophet and then I asked him who was it he said Abu Bakr Rafali before we had men who would go in the midst of the enemies of the uh, uh, Ahlul Bayt in their center Damascus was their center in the mosque of Bani Umayyah the uh, tribe of Umayyah in their prayer, we, he would publicly scream and say, May Allah revile uh, Abu Bakr. Who does it now? Why did, do we not follow the same methods of our ancestors? Where are these heroic acts? And when they captured him, they brought him to Subki. And when he asked him, what do you mean by those words? He did not say, I meant shimmer when I said, may Allah curse the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. He said it clearly and honestly. He said, I meant Abu Bakr. He said, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He said, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Yazid and Muawiyah. He listed them all, one after the other. He said, no, I do not only mean Abu Bakr. No, all those I mentioned were unjust. He said, then I ordered him to be taken prisoner. Subki did. Then I, to put chain around his neck. Then the uh, uh, Maliki uh, judge they kept rotating him around each other of the fourth sects to judge upon him uh, what they seem uh, deem worthy. And the Maliki judge, he hit him and he did not surrender this man, kept continuing on with what, what he said. He did not go back and deny it, despite the torture. We say ourselves small in front of these uh, giants uh, of, uh, in our history. And said he continued being tortured despite he could not, uh, he would not uh, deny what he said or uh, seek forgiveness. He continued saying he is the enemy of Allah Abu Bakr and he was unjust to uh, Fatima Zahra, took what was not his uh, hers and he falsified uh, uh, something on the tongue of the Messenger of Allah in her inheritance. He has a case, a case of vengeance with Abu Bakr. 
saying that I will not forget what Abu Bakr did. He's uh, a tyrant and a liar. And Maliki, the judge, uh, continued torturing him. And Monday and the next Wednesday, and he could, he would not go back and surrender his claims. Then, in another event, he did not uh, claim he is innocent. He continued. In fact, every time he was asked, he says, if I said it, then Allah will know. Then he was, uh, they said, you will excuse you, but they said, repent from my guilt. He said, I will repent from Allah. But he did not say anything else. And when they saw there was no use with, with this man and he would not uh, surrender and continued on reviling uh, Abu Bakr, then they judged his execution. And Subki says, uh, Subki was the person who signed his death, this man's death. He said, what made this uh, easy for me, what I used here as, uh, as uh, evidence, so simply because he reviled or cursed Abu Bakr and Umar and insulted them, he considers that as an act of disbelief then that made it easy for, for me to declare him a disbeliever. And that what made it easier further is because when I asked him to repent from his act, he did not. Subki so continued uh, with, uh, with his justifications for how this uh, great martyr uh, was executed. And uh, what did he say? Is, this is what we will use against him. And what uh, we can use as proof in killing this the person that in this place that what happened, no doubt it harms or hurts the Messenger of Allah. And hurting the Messenger of Allah means that the person who's done it deserves to die. This is good. We accept it. A very good rule. Do you say the law, Islamic law, is that if uh, and anyone who purposely, purposefully and uh, harms the Messenger of Allah, then he is judged to be executed and uh, to uh, be killed. And you use that to kill this poor man. It's as if the Messenger of Allah said, whoever harms Abu Bakr has harmed me. Whoever harmed Umar has harmed me. This is how they justify themselves, saying that this man has insulted those they call the companions, and that caused harm to the um, or hurt the heart of the Messenger of Allah, and that deserves to be uh, that man deserves to be executed. Um, how dare uh, dare you say these things? Who was the man? Uh, who's the uh, who was the person that the Messenger of Allah said? Of if you harm them, you have harmed me. Why have you not judged Abu Bakr to be worthy to be executed? Did not uh, the Lady Azara in your sources, not ours, say, Allah testify that they have hurt me? Why did you not use that as justification? Uh, to judge that Abu Bakr deserves to be executed, just like you have for this poor Rafali person. Then Subki came and then he tried to justify himself further, saying maybe he did not mean to hurt the Messenger of Allah. And uh, maybe it happened, but it was not intended. We care not about these justifications. We know that when the Abu Bakr uh, hurt Zara, peace be upon her. He meant it. He meant to hurt the Messenger of Allah as well. How could you not? How could you not? And you narrate that 
when he uh, asked his gang thugs to assault the home of uh, uh, Lady Zahra, he gave them permission to even fight to the death. In, in this source, that Abu Bakr sent Umar ibn al-Khattab to Ali and those who were Ali to force them out of the home of Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her, and said, if they refused, fight them to the death. And you tell us that he did not mean to harm them or hurt them. What more harm is there than death? Fighting in the home of Zahra, peace be upon her, and you claim that is not harm in Zahra, to assault her home, to hurt her uh, husband, Imam Ali, peace be upon her, is not hurting her. Omar brought with him uh, firewood and then uh, put and, uh, fire around the home of Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her. And Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her, said, you come to burn down our house. He said, yes, and I will if they do not accept Abu Bakr and go with what the nation has uh, gone with. So that means in the judgment of Islam, in the law of Islam, that now that we determine that Abu Bakr meant to hurt uh, Zara and hurting Zara is hurting the messenger Allah and Allah, then in the sh Sharia law, then that person deserves to be executed. Abu Bakr must be executed by this nation to execute his idol. It is not permissible that Abu Bakr remains a praised person, not uh, to remain like this as an idol and a symbol. He must be executed. He must cease to exist. This law was established by Sukki which is a Bakri scholar. And we use this against them. This nation, if they were uh, not to execute and end Abu Bakr, then they will be cursed. It is prohibited to say that Abu Bakr is our master and may Allah be pleased with him. It's entirely forbidden. Repent to Allah and return to the uh, the uh, Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon them. Abu Bakr, the major Dajjal, he was the person who uh, ordered the assault on the house of Fatima, peace be upon her. He was the one who asked and permitted terror and violence. This assault was for what? What did it lead to? What did it uh, lead to in the end? Do you know this nation of Islam? That this uh, monstrous assault on the home of Zahra, peace be upon her, uh, what it led to? Uh, listen to the uh, weeping of, of and the words of Imam Ali, peace be upon him. After he lost, it, lost her, in these nights, uh, he lived away from people, uh, broken uh, three days. That him, peace be upon him, concealed away from people, three days, not leaving, only to visit the uh, grave of the Messenger of Allah or for prayer. And his companion were uh, hurt and, and they were saddened by this. And they sent to him Ammar ibn Yasir or Salman in another narration. And they entered his home and he saw him and Hassan on his, to his right and Hussein to his, his left. And once he would look at Hassan and cry. And once he would look at the Hussein, peace be upon him, peace be upon them and cry. Ammar said, I saluted him and he saluted me back. Sat down, I said to him, uh, my master, you 
uh, tell us to be patient with uh, our miseries and your companions have been greatly saddened by your disappearance and they cannot um, live with it anymore he said to him yes you are true uh, but I have lost the messenger of Allah peace and blessings be upon him when I lost Fatima she was uh, the only companion I had she, when she spoke it's as if the messenger of Allah spoke and when she walked it's as if it was the messenger of Allah walked oh Ammar I've never felt the pain of this uh, tragedy uh, but when she uh, left and when she is gone I felt the uh, uh, loss of the messenger and what makes this easier to accept is because it was happened in the eyes of Allah when I put Fatima peace be upon her to ritually bathe her I saw one of her ribs broken And in it implanted a nail. And her back blackened from the abuse and, and, and the uh, hitting. And what breaks my heart that she was, that she hid that from me. She hid that from me, afraid because she does not want me to live in great pain. She hid that from me so I would not live in great pain. What was important to Fatima, peace be upon her, was Ali. Even this very small thing said she does not uh, see him pained, so she conceals her pain, her sadness if that meant uh, that that must be done that she would have done it she did not complain to, her, to him of what the people have done to her in detail so she did not um, let, uh, she, she, he can live with the, uh, peacefully that is Fatima, peace be upon her that the nation does not know her level that the nation did not honor her and respect her and did not honor and respect their messenger for her, uh, by respect and Zara. The Lady Zara was buried al uh, alone in the dark, uh, darkness of night and no one attended uh, the, her ceremony but a few of the believers. Was it not supposed that this entire nation would come out uh, crying for Zahra, peace be upon her, putting her to rest? It was a very painful night. It was the night that the Lady of Zahra, peace be upon her, was put to rest away from the eyes of others. Said so that the two tyrants, the oppressors, would not know the location of her grave. I say, our lady, even if we have not been alive in that time, and even if we did not join with the mourners at that night to put you to rest with them, but this night we will carry your coffin and we ask that Allah places us amongst those who have uh, carried your coffin and put you to rest on that night. You, the Siddiqa, the martyr, we are with you uh, in this dunya and the hereafter.